All right, it looks like we're recording in the cloud. Good. So, um, wait for two seconds here. So, all right. Um, next up is uh, Emily Lockling from Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, going to be sharing with us development of a collector application for invasive species surveying. Emily, go ahead and take it away. Check your audio. I'm trying to figure out how to share there my you go. screen with this. And then share screen. There's a green button say that says share screen right on the bottom. There should be a bar. Okay. So I guess I have to share my screen and then get into presenter view. Yep. All right. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> So as I was introduced, my name is Emily Lockling. I'm from Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College, and this is on developing a collector application for invasive species sampling. So I got to work on this project with Dr. Carl Sack and with Kelsey Taylor, um, the, or the um, invasive species coordinator from Fond du Lac um, Resource Management. So an overview, invasive species in Minnesota. We know there's a lot. We hear a lot about buckthorn, about uh, zebra mussels, but the range that they reach is actually quite large. Um, there's over 300 invasive plant species in Minnesota that are mapped by the Early Detection and Distribution Mapping System, and about 8% of Minnesota's lakes are on the infested waters list. And of course, the reason that we are so concerned about this is because it cr creates a competition with our natural species, it reduces biodiversity, and it's a whole chain of effects that happens when we have our in native species impacted by invasive species. So what are the goals of collector application in this scenario? So because I'm developing it for uh, Fond du Lac specifically, my goals were to allow for consistency and organization, which if you've ever worked on a team that's very large, you know that not all the time everyone will write things exactly the same. And I wanted to enable rapid data collection. So I didn't want multiple people having to type everything out. And I wanted it to be enabled for use on personal electronic devices, because with the pandemic, a lot of different IT groups have been very overwhelmed. So I wanted to develop something that could be used on a cell phone. So then the way we do this is we do it in uh, ArcGIS Online, and we do this using a feature layer. So you create a feature layer. Um, I used one with points, lines, and polygons, but I really did just focus on points specifically. And the way that I ended up doing this was with um, an Excel sheet that was shared with me by Fond du Lac. Um, they were super generous and they shared exactly what they needed done. But there were a couple questions that came up with this kind of format because of course not everything can be accomplished um, exactly the way I'd love it to. So there's no way for things to auto-populate. So of course the point names, they're gonna have to kind of be on that themselves to make sure that the point names are formulated the way they want. But I was able to make drop-down menus for a lot of the different features. And that's, you can see a little bit of an example over on the right. So then in the feature layers, um, when you put them in, you can, when you're creating the drop down menu, you put in the label, which is going to be what it pops up as when you're selecting from your drop down menu. And you create an individual code that is unique to that specific um, species or whatever that feature is for you. So I actually just selected the unique ID from the Excel sheet because I felt like that was the way to keep it the most consistent, even though they're not really going to see the code. I figured that was probably the most organized way to do it. So then the way that it pops up in the app actually is it will come up as this full drop-down menu. Ah, uh, goodness. So some of my fields I chose to leave up to unique individual text input. And that was obviously things like notes and general location, but also for um, roads, because I don't know their exact roads and point names because point names can't auto-populate. And then several fields I chose the drop down because I felt that was the most organized. 
So that was for common name, scientific name, habitat, property type, density, and those were all limited to this drop down menu. So nobody can just write in whatever they want really. But then um, not all of them are required, as you can see by the asterisks. The asterisk means it is a required field to fill in, e even if that field just ends up being unknown. Um, so then, now that you have all of the features done in that feature layer, you can pull it up as a web map using the open map viewer. And then to actually get it to access on your phone, this is a problem that I had. Um, there's a few different things you need to make sure you toggle and share. And it seems so simple looking back on it, but I struggled with this for a little bit. So you have to make sure you share it. Um, because I'm in a tribal GIS organization, I had to make sure that it was set to the sharing level owner, but then set to group sharing for the tribe specifically. And then for the toggles, you wanna make sure that you hit enable editing because that will allow you to actually edit and work on it from your app. So then inside the application, um, it pops up, it'll show you the maps that are visible and they will only show up once you toggle enable, otherwise it'll just say no maps, even if you've been working on one. So then this is kind of what it looks like from where I'm at. And then this is an example point layer. Um, so I can actually access that on my phone right now. Um, I don't know how much it would add to this because the last thing that I just showed you is kind of what it looks like right now. But with the future of this project, uh, immediate future, I hope to expand into additional surveys. Um, in that Excel sheet that was shared with me, they had multiple surveys, not just the field surveys for terrestrial invasive species. They also had things for emerald ash borer specifically for aquatic invasive species, and those will have a little bit different requirements field wise. Um, and I want to update the symbology. As you can see, there's a little red circle there, but because of the base map that I chose, it doesn't stand out very much. So it's just something that I was going to do before this, and I forgot until I had already taken all my screenshots and uploaded them, but that should be a pretty quick fix. And it's actually accessible right now on my phone, which you cannot see. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe. Yep, there we are. Functional. <laughs> so I've actually been having some fun looking at this at different areas, and I think it's just a super unique way to tackle an organization issue in a way that's actually accessible through personal electronic devices. So I will be taking questions. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Emily. Questions for our speaker. I, I will have a couple, but I'll, I'll open the floor up to others first. Can you remind me um, who is already or is expected to be using this? And second question, somewhat tangential, how would people that are not at Fond du Lac, but like the technology, in particular NASA type people, how might they benefit from this particular development? So anyone can use this kind of application using the Esri software ArcGIS Online, and you can enable sharing with anyone in your organization, or if you, like if you create an organization, or I believe you can even share it with individual people, um, not exactly sure on that aspect of it, but for NASA, studying Earth systems especially is very important with this, um, including vegetation and ecosystems. And it's part of the mission of the science mission doctorate. Um, it improves the efficiency of data collection for a range of applications. So, <laughs> I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do with it. Thank you. Thank you. So Emily, what's one thing that if uh, in going through this project that that you learned that was maybe unique or surprising that you weren't expecting to come across? That's always a question I love asking too. So what's what's um, something unique or surprising? Well, because for me this is just for the development of the application. I didn't do any of the field surveying myself, but I suppose I would be kind of interested in how much of um, the different features that I was looking for, especially like auto population, I was surprised to find how many other people online had already brought this up and wanted this to be a feature for the future. Um, I think that there's so much that they can do with it. And 
I'm really excited to see how Esri develops it in the future. So kind of connecting that, so you're talking about development in the future. What, can you speak a little bit more to that uh, since I'm moderating, whatever, what, what's, what is sort of the, the future plans a little bit, Get, if, if you can expand on that a little bit. What? Um, for me specifically or for the application? Either, either one, either one, run with, run either way. Um, well, for me specifically, um, I do hope that I get to keep working with natural resources on this project for a while because I feel like they do have a lot more surveys that we can work on and I'm just getting the hang of it. So I'm really excited um, that I'm finally understanding well enough that I feel like I'm contributing. Um, as for Esri's developments, I know that they've, they're always updating stuff and adding new versions. Um, I want to say the most recent version for Collector just came out not too many years ago. Um, I guess I'm not so sure about the history or what they're currently working on, so I can't speak to that, but. How did your studies at Fond du Lac help you get into this or how, what's the relationship between this project and, and your coursework? So I'm an environmental science major um, and I started working uh, with methylmercury research at Fond du Lac um, through a work study program and I ended up taking GIS courses with my friends because there's a few that are required for the environmental science degree um, and I ended up working on this because <laughs> I guess I just ended up liking mapping a lot more than I thought I would um, and it's um, I want to say this counts as a work study too, I believe. Um, I'm trying to formulate all the words in my head. It's not working so good. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm actually pleased to hear that things that you're studying have real world, real immediate applications. That's great. Thank you. We have other questions from the audience, we can probably take uh, one, one or two more possibly here. Carl, you're behind all of this. If you're there, do you have things you'd like this group to be talking about? I mean, I've been listening in and I think Emily uh, pretty much presenting, presenting her work uh, in, as, uh, you know, the work she's done thus far, it's still a kind of a new project, but it's just this, you know, um, it is, as you said, having a real world application for our partners at the Fond du Lac Band um, to be able to uh, improve the efficiency of their research. So, um, Emily, do you want to say anything else about the additional surveys? I, you mentioned there are additional surveys. Do you, you want to explain a little bit about what um, what those look like, what the templates are? Yes. Um, I guess um, I'm not sure of the specific fields that go into each of those. Um, Sorry, my brain is not working right now. <laughs> so I believe that what I'm going to end up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, so I believe the biggest thing is going to be figuring out how to do the rest of the surveys because they were all attached in the same Excel sheet, but I don't think it would make sense for them to all go in the same feature layer, obviously, because they are separated out by what kinds of surveys they are. So it's going to be putting each of the new surveys into its own feature layer and then determining from there if there's a way to get those into the same map, if they want them in the same map. Um, so there's a few more meetings that have to go on before I really get into the work on that. Well, thank you, Emily. Let's let's thank thank our speaker. Thank you for, for this great presentation, Emily. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes.